Tell me, who gave him the victory, if not the power of heaven? At Issus, we had 130,000 Persians, but Alexander smashed them to pieces. Who gave him the victory, if not the deity? It was not for nothing that he said, the deity himself fights best for us. I can't remember a battle where we didn't manage to beat those two-legged brutes. It's all from heaven. And finally, Egypt. Do you remember the trip to the Oracle of Amun when we almost lost water in the Libyan desert? Didn't the priest recognize Alexander as the son of the chief Egyptian god? All this is nonsense, said Theagenes. The Persians are a brave people, but their weapons are no good. They are not taught fighting techniques, so they fight the way they know how. That's why one Macedonian can resist three barbarians, and Persis herself is now decrepit. I have heard that every day they have a quarrel between satraps or a rebellion. There are many different tribes here. Iranians rob them, so they take up the axe. The people are completely impoverished because of taxes. The country is spit upon, disgraced by its king. They say that beardless eunuchs put these kings on the throne at their own will and kill them themselves at the instigation of the king's wives and their lovers. The eunuch Bogoaz is famous for having put three kings on the throne and killed them. He would have gotten to the fourth, but Kodoman cut off his head in time. Persis is like a sick man. Where does a sick man get his strength? Do you understand? Well, as for the priests of Ammon, if I grab you by the throat and clench you properly, you will recognize me not only as a son, brother, uncle, nephew, grandfather, grandson, brother-in-law, 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 father-in-law, or son-in-law of a god, but even as the father of all gods that exist. Is that clear? Well, okay. Fegan waved his hand tiredly. It is rightly said, do not take care of the grief that has settled. And it is also said, we do not live as we want to live as we can. Is the soup ready? The marathon runner himself realized that he was talking too much. For three years, he had been silently looking, listening, gaining insight. He had once believed that Alexander was the son of God, saving up his anger, and now he could not resist and spilled it in Drakil's face. It was Laertes, the fool, who came to his hand with his ridiculous question so that he should be damned to Tartarus. But the Aegeans. Drakil began again, but Theogenes, wanting to end the argument, shouted angrily, Shut your mouth, you chump. I've had an earache from your ranting for a long time. Drakil, eager to find support, turned to Laertes and his companions. But they did not look up. With their hearts, the children of the poor are on Theogenes' side. His thoughts, however, are too dangerous. Who would dare to show that they approve of his words? Nor Drakil, who resembles a greedy moneylender in his ways. Only the brown-haired Laertes responded to the merchant's gaze with an obsequious smile. But what good is one young man with a yellow-haired boy? Drakil scratched his black shaggy growths on his temples with concern and shut his hoarse throat, as Theogenes had advised. At that time, somewhere to the right, it seems, near the royal tents, flutes sang sonorously and longingly. A detour! The soldiers, lazily lounging around the hot fires, at once came into motion. They hastily shook off their chitons, adjusted their harnesses, wiped off the yellow dust from their armor. Then again they sat down on carefully rolled up cloaks, but now they could no longer hear idle talk. On the faces of all, especially the junior commanders, tension and concentration in the eyes of anxiety. Detour. 
Between the tents moved a crowd of top leaders of the Macedonian army. The king occasionally stopped at the fires, looked at the people, whether there were no drunken, sick, low spirits, whether all shaved before the battle, to prevent the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat to grasp the beard. He went carefully through the bags of the slingers and the quivers of the archers, whether there were enough lead balls and iron arrows, whether the shield was strong, whether the bowstring was changed, whether the armor was fit. He tasted the broth, asked questions, turned away without a word from the negligent soldiers. Now they would be unfortunate, nodded sparingly to the soldiers and nodded to the best-looking soldiers. He even called some of them by their names, extended his hand to them, and the hearts of the rough men who had longed for a warm word in war melted like wax. At last he passed the place where Fegan's troop was stationed. It was the first time in three years of war that Marathon had seen Alexander so close. After all, the king is one, but the leaders of small detachments of medium infantry are many thousands. Yes, the Persians are afraid of Alexander and will not attack him first, and even in the darkness of night. Preparing to repel an unexpected blow, they will stand in formation until dawn, exhausted without sleep, exhausted from endless false alarms, tired like oxen on plowing, and in the morning, when they begin to bounce their legs, fresh, rested army of Alexander will rush on the barbarians from above and mix them with the ashes of the plain. Simple and great. This is not the first time this has happened. At Granik, the old man persistently persuaded Alexander to postpone the battle. The enemy occupied the upland, while the Macedonians held at the bottom, in front of the swamp, and Parmenion was afraid to get bogged down in the mire. But the king would not listen to him. Will I, said the son of Philip, having so easily crossed the Hellespont, stop before this wretched river? He rushed forward and defeated the enemy. After Tyre, the city of the Phoenicians, subject to the Persians, had fallen. Darius offered Philip's son friendship all the possessions westward from the Euphrates to the Aegean, 10,000 talents ransom for his family, who had been captured by the Macedonians at Issus and the hand of one of his daughters. If I were Alexander, said Parmenion then, I would accept these terms. Yes, replied the accursed youth, if I were Parmenion, I too would accept what the Persian king offers me. But as I am Alexander, the terms set by Darius do not satisfy me. Why do I need half the state when I can take it all? Why do I need his money when I have plenty of it? And I can marry one or both of Darius's daughters without his permission. After all, I have them in my wagon. Yes, Alexander is clever, brave, and shrewd, thought the old commander brokenly. He is a thousand times smarter than the decrepit donkey Parmenion. The conclusion did not comfort the white-headed Macedonian. On the contrary, it angered him and caused a wave of resistance in his envious soul. Our bright lord, damn him to hell, has become quite insolent said the old man to his son, as they descended the hillock and marched toward the camp. Philotas nodded silently. To the success to which he owed you and me, Parmignon continued, he became dizzy. He seems to have imagined himself to be the son of the god Ammon. Philotas nodded again. He adored his parent and always agreed with him. Isn't it time to break his divine horns? Parmenion whispered and glanced at the men lying around the fires. Well, Philotus wheezed. There are many dissatisfied among the warriors. All are tired of the campaign, which Apollo witnesses 
has no end in sight. At night, into the tent, a blow, another, and... Philota spread out his thick, furry fingers, then quickly clenched them into a huge fist and raised them upwards, as if shaking the severed head by the hair. At the king's tent they saw the main bodyguards of Alexander, thin, wiry Ferdika and black-eyed, handsome Ptolemaios Lagus. Ferdika looked at father and son with outright dislike, while the cheerful Ptolemaios Lagus was merrily baring his teeth and tapping away on the hilt of his sword the dance of the Maton fisherwomen. In the evening, after a short council of war, Alexander was left alone in the tent. He stretched out on a soft rug presented by the people of Gordium, the same Gordium where he had been shown the knot tied on the chariot drawbar by the ancient king of the Phrygians. He who unties the knot, said the legend, shall possess all Asia. Philip's son, not thinking long, cut it with his sword. The memory of this incident cheered the king. Yes, the sword is the key to the barbarian country. Alexander put his thin, wiry hands with strong palms behind his head and smiled. The silent Ferdika appeared, treading heavily. Less self-serving than the rest of the king's associates, Ferdika, as usual, was dressed in a deep chiton, girded with a worn belt without any bling or trinkets, and, as if on purpose, he wore stubby and unsightly sandals. He looked dull and uncouth, and only Alexander knew how clever and sharp his first bodyguard was. It was because of his intelligence and unselfishness that the king trusted Ferdika as himself. He would not sell out. Ferdika despises small people, pursuing one another because of trifling passions important only to themselves. He loves only Alexander, for he believes that the young king, with his magnitude, is not living in the world for nothing, and that he is worth helping. The wind, which had risen after breakfast, fluttered the brushes of the tent and inflated the cloth like a sail. From the restless flame of the cedar fire, the torchlight cast wavering shadowy spots across Ferdika's long, bony, nasal face. A greet from the middle infantry, Ferdika grumbled. Ask to join you. Why? Ferdika chewed his mustache, then said squeamishly, A denunciation. Oh! Alexander raised himself on an elbow and pulled the colorful oriental blanket over his bare chest. Call! Drakeel showed himself. His round, flabby, sly face was glistening with fat. He took three steps forward and did what no other Greek or Macedonian would have humiliated himself to do. He knelt down before the king. This pleased the descendant of Philip. He nodded graciously to Drakeel. Tell me. Theagenes, commander of the 44th Small Detachment of Medium Infantry of the Greeks, is spreading false rumors about your majesty among the soldiers. They say that your father is not Philip, that you, I dare not say, were born of some mercenary Thracian. He called you a brigand, not the son of the god Ammon, and said many other obscene things. Drakeel fell silent and bowed his bald head low. Surrounded by a crown of black hair, the bald spot looked like the scrub bottom of a copper cauldron. Did you hear Ferdika? The king asked the bodyguard. Yes, Ferdika replied briefly. Drag this Theogenes to me. And you, what about you? Drakeel. You hide behind the canopy and stay there until I call you. The merchant obediently hid. Alexander's face did not change expression. He smiled carefree. All his life he had been surrounded by conspirators. The king remembered Pausanias, a noble Macedonian youth whom no one suspected of treason at a feast suddenly killed Philip. 
Some time later, the commander Attalus almost revolted the troops. Even when Alexander seemed to have brought calm to Elan, conquered Asia Minor and reached the Syrian gates, rebellious Athens sent ambassadors to Darius. Children of dogs, Alexander scolded angrily to himself. People worthy of contempt did not arouse his anger. What do they want? Why do they sacrifice themselves in vain? They wriggle under my feet like horrors, powerless even to bite. And like beetles they die, crushed by my foot. Do they think that they can stop me? Me, the son of the god Ammon. The Macedonian shrugged his shoulders in bewilderment. A horde of worms. I have destroyed them and will continue to destroy them. He believed so much in himself, in his vocation and invulnerability, that Drakeel's denunciation even made him laugh, as Heracles would have laughed at the threats of a five-year-old child. When Ferdicus brought the pale Theogenes into the tent, the king was still lying in the same posture, resting his elbow on the carpet. Greetings to Alexander, said Theogenes deftly, removing his helmet from his head and staring expectantly at his lord's face. Greetings to Fegen, Alexander replied good-naturedly. They say you spoke ill of me, did I? Fegen took a step back. It's clear Drakeel denounced him. It is unworthy to deny it. True, Theogenes admitted, his eyebrows drawn together sharply at the bridge of his nose. Why did you do it? Why did you? Fegan had nothing left to lose. Why did you do what you did? Oh! Alexander raised himself, sat down, and stared at Theogenes. Have I offended you in any way? You did. How? Fegan showed his helmet and cuirass with his palm. Are you unhappy in the war? Alexander asked dryly. I am. The others don't complain. They went to Asia without shirts, and now they all have gold jingling in their pouches. I don't... Why not? I don't know how to rob. You don't know how to rob? Alexander's eyebrows arched even more sharply than they had when he'd made his rounds. Why so? I myself was robbed by my uncle Lama, and I suffered. If I rob anyone else, he will suffer as well, not good. Ah! The king bit his lip so as not to show his irritation. But this is Asia. It's not a sin to rob a barbarian. He's still a man. You're a complete fool, I see. Alexander grumbled angrily. The heat of the east must be bad for your head. Besides, you're wearing a shell. It's heavy on you. Permission to remove it. I suggest you switch to light infantry. Tomorrow you'll go ahead of the others and start the fight. The cool air of the fields will refresh your brain, and you'll stop talking nonsense about your king. Do you understand me? Yes, Fiagan replied sullenly. Alexander sentenced him to death. He who goes at the head of the army and starts a fight rarely survives. You damn talker! Who pulled your tongue? If you hadn't said such nonsense today, you wouldn't be standing before the king now. Shall I not bow down before the Macedonian and beg his forgiveness? No, Theogenes is a freeborn citizen of the Athenian state. He should not humiliate the honor of his city. And no matter how much the Marathoner regretted what had happened, he did not lose his head and waited outwardly calm, though overcast, for what would happen next. Alexander turned to Ferdika and uttered a few strange lingering words. From the sound and structure of his speech, it seemed as if he were speaking Greek, but the speech of the Macedonians was mixed with Thessalian, Epirus, and Thracian, so that Theagenes could not make out anything. But Drakeel, who lived in Alexander's homeland for three years, understood the king well. 
That's what these Athenians are like, said the son of Philip. Zeus himself can't change them. Send the bastard to Balacra's archers. In the morning in battle, some barbarian will guess to pierce him with an arrow. And if he doesn't, then he's a lucky Greek. Alexander yawned. If he lives, let him live. You don't think I'm afraid of him, do you? He doesn't look like a conspirator. He's just stupid. Ferdika took the marathoner by the scruff of the neck and pushed him out of the tent. Alexander called out to Drakil. The merchant fell to the carpet again. You did a good thing. Alexander took the gold ring off his finger and tossed it to Drakil like a bone to a dog. Listen to what the warriors are saying and tell me. I appoint you commander of the squad in place of Theogenes. Now go away. I'm sleepy. From the direction of Gavgamel came the heart-rending cry of a donkey. The wind died down. It became light. Alexander woke up and told him to call Parmenion. How are the Persians? They were in battle formation all night, Parmenion answered with annoyance. And now they are still standing. Good! Alexander jumped up, stretched with a crunch and struck the gong. The bodyguards brought in golden basins with water for ablutions. They had belonged to Darius before. The Macedonian had captured them at Isis. The mist that had hung over the plain since dawn slowly melted under the rays of the rising sun. And the Macedonian saw the troops of Darius. Just as a cloud covers half the sky, so this great crowd of armed men filled almost the entire space between the Gavgemels and the ridge of hills on which the son of the god Ammon had entrenched himself. Darius built his army in two lines. In the first was the infantry. In the second, auxiliary detachments. On both flanks of the first line, cavalry was located. In front of the whole formation, wriggled like snakes, trunks of elephants, and glittering knives of 200 chariots. The king and his retinue took a place in the middle of the battle order. Warriors from many Asian tribes were gathered here. On the left wing could be seen the Bactrian horsemen, the Dahi and the Arahoths. Nearby stood Persians on foot and horseback, Elamites and Caduceans. The right wing was dotted with cavalry from southern Syria, Palestine and Mesopotamia, Lydians, Parthians, Sakas, Tapurs, Albans, Hindus, Greek mercenaries serving the Persians, and Mardian archers. The depth of the formation was filled with Babylonians, Sitakan, Uxians, and warriors from the shores of the Red Sea. In addition, in front of the left wing, Darius put forward a thousand riders, Scythians. Cavalry from Armenia and Cappadocia advanced in front of the right wing. Patterns and stripes of long caftans, wide robes, spacious chitons, short jackets, white cloaks, gray, red, and blue capes and coverlets, plaid skirts, ringlets, armor, cuirasses, turbans, fur hats, felt tiaras, and copper helmets. All this merged into one continuous and so variegated and bright carpet that at a glance at it rippled in the eyes. The spearheads of tens of thousands of spades glittered unbearably, swords rang, wicker shields clanged, whips clicked, and horses roared shrilly. As Alexander had foreseen, the barbarians were tired from the night vigil, and now, having broken the formation, were squatting, lying in the dust or dozing, leaning against horses and wagons. It was impossible to take in the whole horde at a single glance. Both sides of the Asiatic order of battle were lost far to the right and left in the puffs of dust that swept upward. Horns shrieked on the hills, 
the Macedonian's lines came into motion. Alexander showed himself. He was clutching with his feet the sides of the famous Bucephalus, covered with wolf skins, and waving his spear. Smelling the odor of wolf skins, the horse rushed forward. The king's head was covered with a horned helmet. His chest and back were covered by a silent cuirass with the image of Medusa Gorgon. A fringe of copper plates hung from the cuirass to the hips, front and back. The hem of the red cheton did not reach his knees. His arms were bare to the elbows, and a short but broad cloak fluttered behind him. From fifty thousand throats a shout burst out. Glory to Alexander! This shout reached the Persians and at once raised them to their feet. Alexander, restraining the hot horse, gave short orders. They were carried out quickly and without fuss. The commanders already knew from the evening what to do. In the middle of the army, Alexander put a phalanx. 16,384 heavily armed soldiers hoplite lined up in 16 rows of 1,024 people in each row. The phalanx equaled in front 2,000 paces. One man in front and 16 in depth constituted a small trooploch. A column of 16 soldiers in front and 16 in depth, 256 men, formed a syntagma. From 16 syntagmas formed a small phalanx. From four small phalanxes, one main phalanx. Goplites held in their hands long 12 cubits, pike sarissa, and large rectangular shields. Their heads were protected by crested helmets. All had swords hanging at their sides. The right flank of the army was occupied by Gaithar horsemen, clad in lats, armed with sarissas, and curved Thracian swords Mahara. From their round bronze helmets, they had horsetails hanging down their backs. There were eight jeters, or sixty-four warriors in each ooze. They were commanded by Philotas, son of Parmenion. The gap between the phalanx and the jeter's detachment was filled by medium infantry, shield-bearers, who were to ensure the success of the heavy cavalry in battle. Selected hypospists, as they were called, had shields shrouded in silver. The shield-bearers were led by Nicanor, the second son of Parmenion. The left wing was led by Parmenion himself. Here, next to a phalanx of hoplites, stood a detachment of Cratera, Greek infantry Erigius, son of Larish, then Thessalian and Greek medium cavalry, under Philip, son of Menelaus. Around the old Parmenion, who was on the extreme left flank, huddled the warriors of the city of Pharsalus, the best of Thessalian riders. In front on the sides of the entire battle order, scattered Thracians from the tribe of Agrians, armed with darts, peons, shooters. Balacra, among them was in Theogenes, squads of barefoot archers and slingers, and light cavalry. Behind the battle order, to repel the Persians if they went for encirclement, Alexander put 8,200 warriors of medium infantry. Thus, if the Asians best strengthened the middle of the army, the Macedonians' main strike force heavy cavalry Heterova put on the right flank. If the army of the Persians resembled an eagle, spread wings, the army of the Macedonians resembled an axe, turned blade to the right and forward. A blow with the mounted fist on the right was a favorite and fighting technique of the Macedonians, because it fell on the weakly fortified left wing of the enemy and immediately upset his ranks. Ah, the old sage. Alexander remembered his mentor Aristotle, whom he had caused so much trouble in his childhood. Do you imagine that the men of the future will call me Aristotle's miserable pupil? That Aristotle will forever be superior to Alexander? No, philosopher. Why do I need your politics, logic, ethics, poetics, rhetoric, physics, and botany? Are you in favor of a small enclosed city of God-fearing plowmen? 
Are you against huge states, large and noisy cities, against trade and craft? But I'm not against them, Alexander. You taught me, so what? I will do the opposite, so that the people of the future will not consider me the chain dog of the Athenian scholar. Alexander waved his hand. The flute sang loudly. The army left the hills, turned with its left wing, and moved slowly across the plain towards the Asians. Alexander and his bodyguards kept on the right wing, close to the Gateras. So much dust rose up from beneath the tens of thousands of stomping feet that the sky turned as yellow as the earth. It was difficult to breathe, keeping an eye on the enemy, tiredly wandering across the murky plain, Alexander suddenly noticed that the size of his army was shorter than that of the Iranian horde. He immediately realized this will prevent him to strike, as is the custom of the Macedonians, the left wing of the enemy. Moreover, the enemy could easily cover the Macedonians from both the left and right flanks. Philotas! He shouted to Parmenion's son, who was not far from the king. Take the right! Ptolemaios! Tell Parmenion to move behind us on the ledge. Parmenion's son turned his cavalry to the right. The Persians saw the reorganization of the enemy ranks. Darius Codomanus decided, apparently, that the moment was favorable for a crushing blow. The warriors driving the war chariots whipped the horses. Two hundred deadly wagons, stacked with crooked legs, rushed forward. Behind them, the elephants ran with a heavy and resounding clatter. Theogene stood with a darkened, gaunt face in front of the entire Macedonian army and waited with his slingshot clenched tightly. Behind him, the Balakra archers froze, moving forward. Theogene's forgot everything now. Draculus, denunciation. Alexander were out of his mind as soon as the marathon runner saw the enemy. He wanted to live. To avoid being killed, you have to kill. The Persians sprayed from the chariots a cloud of arrows. The Greeks, fleeing from the bronze stings, all at once fell to the ground. The first chariot flew straight at Theogene's. He could already distinguish the glowing teeth of men and horses. Now. Fiagin jumped up, twirled his slingshot, and smashed the lead ball right into the charioteer's forehead. The charioteer fell back in his body, jerking the long reins absurdly. The horses sped away, across the road. The Persians tried to straighten the horses, but the peons killed them with their bows. The second chariot crashed into the first, and the rest of the chariots piled up. Balakr's archers, the Agrians, and the peons attacked the chariots from all sides. Iron sickles attached to drawbars, axles, and harnesses tore half-naked archers to pieces, severed arms and heads, Streams of scarlet, steaming blood ran down the curved blades. Bearded charioteers in colorful chitons and leather armor squealed with rage and fear. The nimble Thracians beat the charioteers, climbed into the chariots, and turned them against the Iranians. Fifty battle wagons of Asians still managed to break through the dense crowd of light infantrymen. They rushed upon the Greek phalanx. Warriors, as it was agreed from the evening, parted. Chariots came in the back of heavy infantrymen of the first row, but then they were captured and destroyed by shield-bearers of reserve locks. Unsuccessful was also the attack of elephants, when the huge, rippling carcasses of giant animals found themselves in the thick of light infantry Thracians and Hellenes raged around them, as rages during a strong wind around bald clay hillocks young reeds. Planks with iron spikes were thrown under the feet of the elephants. The arrow struck them in the eyes and killed the ringleaders sitting upstairs in the towers. The fight between men and elephants was like a mythical war between gods and titans, and the four-legged titan, 
would roar and flee from a bundle of burning grass with which the god would try to burn his long trunk. Some managed to cut the straps that bound the wrinkled gods of the sons of the jungle, and the towers with the archers fell on the heads of the fighters. At last, having carefully picked up the slain and wounded ringleaders, the elephants turned and ran back. Then, the Persians, taking advantage of the confusion, moved forward in their entire first line. On the right wing was a stubborn battle of Scythians with light cavalry Macedonians. Scythians, Dahi, Bactrians, and Arakotians deftly and quickly threw arrows and knocked Macedonians off their horses, but then retreated, fighting back with straight daggers. Between the left wing and the middle of the Persian army formed a void. This is what Alexander has been waiting for. Philotas to me, he shouted in a wild voice. A lightning bolt struck his mind, and for the briefest instant, while this flash of genius lasted, Alexander mentally saw the entire battlefield, the movement of troops, large and small, and seemed to look into the eyes of every warrior, Macedonian and Persian. He twitched from head to toe with excitement. He was seized, like a young falcon soaring over the foam of the waves, by an infinite confidence in his great, unbreakable power. He grasped Philotas by the shoulder and shouted short and resounding, as if he had plucked a dagger from its sheath with a single jerk. Wedge! The guitars quickly regrouped. Alexander himself led the spearhead of the wedge. Horns blared sharply, overlapping the noise of battle. Thousands of shields rumbled. Macedonians struck them with spears to frighten the enemy. Thousands of throats rang with all their might a peen him in honor of Ares of Enialaya. A sense of unanimity swept through the thousands. Tears of delight sprang from thousands of eyes. Alexander grasped the shaft of the Sarissa, ducked, tilted his head, as if about to scatter everyone with the crooked horns of his gilded helmet, and rushed forward into the gap formed in the ranks of the Iranians. The Gitarai moved in a cloud after him. Heavy Macedonian phalanx struck the Persians from the left. 50,000 Greek Macedonians and 100,000 differently tribalized Asians came together in a bloody battle. The last battle, on the outcome of which depended on the fate of the Persian kingdom. On the right, the Bactrians, Dahi, and Arahoths fell upon the wedge. On the left rolled a rampart of immortals, bodyguards of the Persian king, Midians, Hindus, Mardian riflemen, and Greek Carians who served Darius. In front, the Macedonian wedge was opposed by Sidikin, Uxus, and warriors from the shores of the Red Sea. They were all a brave people, but today the Asians fought without their usual gusto, as they had not slept all night. Alexander rushed at the nearest Persian and struck him in the face with the sharp tip of his sarissa. The Asian, drenched in blood, collapsed under the hooves of the frantically dancing horses. The eyes of his neighbor, a tall Iranian in a striped shawl, met the eyes of the Macedonian king rushing forward. The Iranian threw a glance at the helmet Yunana, so by the name of the East Hellenic tribe Ionians, who lived in Asia Minor and subordinate to Darius, the Persians called all Greeks and Macedonians. On the sides of Alexander's helmet came off a pair of huge, curved, serrated horns, a symbol of kinship with the sun god Ammon, whom the Egyptians depicted in the form of a ram. The Persian turned white and sprang back. A cry went up through the ranks of the fighting men. Zulkarnine. He is here shouted Philip's son defiantly. He had heard that the barbarians had nicknamed him Iskender Zulkarnain, Alexander the Two-Horned. Iskender Zulkarnain, 
repeated the Asians. The cowards turned their horses and fled. The brave rushed to Alexander to die or to stain their sword with the blood of the hated Yunnan by the evil will of whom the war had been going on for three and a half years. The Bactrians pierced the Getaeres with arrows, but Alexander was advancing. The Hyrcanians seized the Macedonians with hair ropes and dragged them off their horses. But Alexander pushed forward. Daki jumped under the feet of Macedonian horses, deftly dodged the hooves, and struck the enemy from the side with an axe. But Alexander was advancing. The Hindus were throwing axes, smashing helmets and skulls without a miss. But Alexander was advancing, and the Gitaires were following him with a giant rockfall, sweeping away everything on the road. Neither arrows, nor ropes, nor axes, nor daggers. Nothing could stop the horsemen, shod in bronze and put far in front of them, Long Pike Sarissa. The Macedonians struck directly in the face and quickly pushed the enemy riders away. The wedge shattered the unstructured ranks of the Asians and steadily embedded itself in the middle of the Persian army, aiming the spearhead straight at Darius Codomanes. Dareos, roared Alexander, shaking his spear. Dareos, come to the duel, you cowardly jackal. You fled from me at Issus, but today you will not escape. Philip's son said these words in Persian he learned for three years, and Darius, who heard the voice of the invincible Macedonian, the sky seemed smaller than a dish. As at Issa, he was the first of all to turn his horse and rushed away from the battlefield. He was in such a hurry that he dropped his helmet, bow, and royal robe on the way. Noticing Darius's flight, the warriors of the left wing dropped their swords and also turned their horses. Hordes of horsemen and foot soldiers, with stomping and noise, rushed across the plain like herds fleeing from the steppe fire. The Macedonians followed them on their heels, overturning the fleeing ones with Sarissas and cutting them down with Machiris. At the very Gavgamal, the king was caught up by a messenger of Parmenion. He hastily reported that the left wing of the Macedonian army, its very difficult detachments of Indians and Persian cavalry, broke through the formation and reached the wagon. A fierce battle ensued. Oh, you old jackass, Alexander scolded. Where is your profound wisdom, your keen eye, your accurate stroke, which you always boasted of? He grudgingly stopped pursuing Darius, and at the head of the battle hot Gitaris attacked the right flank of the Asians. Hindus, Parthians, and the main parts of the Persians, fighting here, rushed to Alexander in solid rows and began to act on the example of the Macedonians themselves, frontal assault. If usually they drove the horses back and forth and threw darts, now they tried to crush everything that stood in their way. Now they were fighting not for Kodoman, but for their own salvation. Sixty Geters were cut down on the spot. The Asiatics who had broken through left the plain littered with the bodies of the dead and wounded and disappeared into the side of Arbel. Parmenion only afterward captured the Persian camp, where between the fallen and tattered tents wandered bleakly trumpeting elephants and camels. Alexander, having censured Parmenion, rushed again in pursuit of Darius and rushed killing all who got on the way to Arbels until it became dark. When he crossed the Lycus River, he stopped and ordered tents to be pitched. Men and horses needed rest. Having thrown off his copper cuirass and chiton stained with the blood of the enemy, the king bathed. His eyes sparkled, his cheeks and forehead blazed with excitement. Clitarchus, he shouted, rubbing his chest with a piece of clean cloth. 
Hey, Clitarch! Clitarsis, the court chronicler, appeared, a lean and grim man with a wrinkled face and hooked nose. Where is your scroll? Right. A hundred thousand Asians fell at Gaugamela. The Persian army does not exist. The rule of Dareos Kodaman is ended. You got it? The Macedonian gripped his armor again. Clitharch's word. After the Battle of Gavgamel, by the following morning, we found ourselves 420 stadia to the southeast. The army approached the Arbals. As always before a battle, our king, blessed be he, went out himself to reconnoiter. Having learned what he wanted to know, he built the army accordingly and dispersed the units in depth. The second line gave the battle order more stability and served as a shield to repel surprise attacks. After a short resistance, the city fell, like dozens of other cities that stood in the way of the son of the god Ammon. The road to Babylon was open. It surrendered to us without a single shot. The fabulous city I had heard so much about in my homeland, the great capital where the brother of the Lesbos poet Alcaeus had served as a mercenary about 200 years ago. The same one who once unrequitedly loved the beautiful Sappho. To him, his kinsman, Alcaeus dedicated a poem like this. From distant lands you brought home a sword with an ivory hilt set in gold. So you served the Babylonians bravely with Hellenic valor. You fought to the death in single combat and slew the king's bodyguard, who was nearly five cubits tall. If the Hellenes once served the Babylonians, now the Babylonians serve the Hellenes. Such are the ways of divine providence. Here Alexander solemnly accepted the title of King of Babylon and the four parts of the world, led us further to the southeast and captured one after another two more Persian capitals, Susa and Persepolis. As we reached the nest of the cursed Iranian kings, Alexander gave Persepolis to fire and sword, destroyed palaces and temples, exterminated the clergy, burned the ancient books of Zoroastrians. The warriors got rich booty. In Persepolis, we rested for four months. Here it became known that Dareos Kodoman fled after the Battle of Gavgamela to the city of Ekbatana, the capital of the Madai people. Having strengthened the army with replenishment from Pella and detachments composed of the inhabitants of the conquered regions, Alexander moved in the spring to Ekbatana. The cavalry covered for 15 days almost 6,000 stadia and swiftly raided the city. The last treasures of Kodamanus passed into Alexander's hands. Dareos has fled eastward to Hyrcanus. We are in pursuit of him now. The army has divided into three parts and entered the country by three roads. I am in the advance party. We passed the Girkin Gate yesterday. Ahit is the city of Rega, where Kodaman hides. He will not escape us now. The end of Darius Kodoman. You remember the tale of how Darius died. He lost his throne, his glory, and his good. Smitten by the swords of his cronies, he fell with noble blood. Jamie, Iskander's Book of Wisdom. Varahran snatched the carpet bag from his weary shoulder, put it down, or rather, dropped it, and immediately fell to the grass. Varahran's arms and legs ached with fatigue, as if he had been carrying a heavy stone from morning till dark. Hunger made him dizzy. His tongue was rough without water, as if it had been sprinkled with coarse sand. The fugitive got his breath and crawled to the huge puddle that glistened at the bottom of the lake. The clay around the puddle was dry and cracked, the edges of the gray hard plates curled upward and scratched the skin of his palms. Vararan leaned over the water and recoiled, startled by his own reflection. 
Was he Varahran, a dirty, ragged creature with a skinny, bearded, tan black face? Even in Rega, cursed Rega, let no stone be left unturned, Varahran had looked much better. At the thought of Rega, the traveler turned pale, or rather yellow, as if his face had been carved out of a piece of cheese. The fugitive raised his head and looked around, to the north, to the left of Vararan, one after another of the barren reddish mountains piled up. The farther away, the higher the ridges became, the steeper their summits rose. In the wide, winding ravines, which descended from above and emerged at their mouths into the plain, the sand lay in frozen waves. To the right lay the desert. Spring was at an end. The scarlet tulips had bloomed and withered on the dunes. The grass, which had recently been so thick and lush, seemed to be rusty. In another month, the colors of spring would be gone. Only the fleshy leaves of the poisonous trichodesma, which had grown so thickly, would retain their dark green color. The silence that hung over the mountains and desert was not broken by the cries of the shepherds, the barking of the dogs, or even the cawing of the eagles. When the fugitive was sure that no one was threatening him, he put his dark, parched lips to the warm water. He drank long and greedily, and only broke away from the puddle when his stomach swelled and nausea came to his throat. Varahran got up, made his way to his bag and ate a piece of flat stale bread moving his jaws slowly and sighing heavily. Then, picking up the bag, he crawled into a rain-washed crevice and immediately fell into a hazy sleep. Farahran woke up three hours later, and not of his own accord. He was awakened by a strange sound coming from nowhere. Varahran shrank into a ball and froze in his hiding place. The sound grew louder, and the louder it became, the more the fugitive pressed himself against the dry clay wall of the crevice. But gradually, fright was replaced by amazement. Beyond the lifeless hills, which even the beasts seemed to avoid because of their unfriendly appearance, someone was merrily crooning a song. It was not a difficult one. The pot was weary with longing. It's broken into three pieces. We'll fix it. It's nothing. But if they cut off the head, they can't put on a new one. That's the trouble. Is not the spirit of the wilderness there pleasing his black heart? Muttered the fugitive with gray lips. Uncertainty languished more than fear. Cautiously, like a wolf creeping up on a flock of sheep, he crept out of the cleft clung to a huge block of loess torn from the wall of the ravine by the spring flood and poked his head out. A crowd of horsemen rode out from behind a hill overgrown with stunted salt bush. The unknown travelers presented an astonishing sight. Their faces were gaunt and darkened. Their headbands, felt hats, and copper helmets had turned gray from dust. From the holes and crevices of their gilded armor, cut by swords and torn by spears, hung scraps of patterned garments. Dirt stuck to the shriveled silver shields. Holes gaped in the sides of chariots trimmed with blue jahant. Sharp ribs of tired horses peered out from under the shreds of richly embroidered scoops and soft felt blankets. The travelers dismounted they numbered, at a glance, upwards of a hundred men. Half of them wore round caps, tightly belted chitons, and long, narrow pants. Varahran's heart beat joyfully. This was the way the Sogdians dressed. The horses greedily reached for the water, but they were driven away by lashes, and usually horses are the first to drink. Only after they had drunk themselves, People got the animals drunk and let them graze, having tangled their front legs with straps. Then, they cut last year's dry thorns and lit five big fires. 
They did all this without saying a word. Only one of them was still singing, though not so loudly, a song about how the poor pot had grown sad and broken. He was a thin, somewhat stooped man of medium height, wearing a strange garment to match his hands. The singer's head was covered with a soft leopard skin cap, a sign of belonging to a higher caste. His cloak, whose fluttering flaps hung down almost to his heels, was also made of spotted skins. With his unusual attire, the singer stood out clearly from all the people near the lake. Must be a Madai, thought Varahran. But why such a spacious cloak? The mountain elders he had seen in Rega wore only one leopard skin each. The fugitive tried to see the face of the spotted man, but he could not, for the singer, as if on purpose, kept turning his back to him. Will you be quiet at last? Varahran heard someone's angry shout. Why are you so angry? Varhan saw in one of the chariots a man with shoulder-length hair, a flabby yellow face, festering eyes, a massive nose, and a thick, curly beard. Judging by his clothes, he was a Persian. He made a sudden movement. The chains rang. I'm not yelling, the cheerful singer corrected him. I'm singing, and I sing because I am happy in my soul. What are you rejoicing for, son of dust, when you should be crying? Cry if you feel like it. Why should I cry? I rejoice that I'm rid of all my troubles and will soon see my homeland. Damn you and your homeland, said the charioteer angrily. He rattled his chains again and pulled himself up. Hey, help me down. No one moved. Then a little man in a long Persian robe, looking fearfully around at the others, cautiously approached the carriage and gave the yellow-faced man his hand. The prisoner jumped to the ground and grasped his knee with a groan. May Andramin punish you, children of dung worms. On hearing this, one of the travelers, also in Persian trousers, drew a knife and rushed at the prisoner. Shut up, jackal! or I'll cut off your fucking tongue. The prisoner put his palms out in front of him in a frightened manner and backed away. The singer held his attacker by the sleeve. Calm down, Bess. Don't talk to me. The one called Bess abruptly pulled the singer away. Why does he curse us and not himself? Is it his fault I've become what I've become? Is it his fault that we have been wandering the roads like savages since last fall, with no end in sight? And yet he calls down upon me the punishment of the gods? Three deaths is not enough for you, you cowardly hyena. He swung his dagger again, but the singer held him back again. You speak justly, Bess, he said softly. He deserves to be executed, of course. But, it is not good to kill such men without a trial. Let the Council of State Elders decide his fate. Bess, furry eyebrows furrowed, spat in his captive's direction, and with a grunt of displeasure put his dagger back into its scabbard. Though you are a bad man, you are still a man, said the singer to the captive. Sit down by the fire and let your body rest. Now the broth will be boiled, meat will be roasted on spits. We will be refreshed and then we will go on our way again. The captiva limping reached the fire. A little man in Persian clothes gently supported him under his arm. Oh good, oh Ramazda, sobbed the captive, lying on the thorny grass. What have I done to offend you, O oh god of light? Or is there no more power in your hand? and your evil brother Anhraman has seized power over all things. He gritted his teeth and struck his temple with his fist, but no one spoke a word of consolation to him. The singer sat down beside him. Only now did Varahran get a good look at him. The fugitive almost shrieked. He had seen this man somewhere. The rising breeze ruffled strands of his long golden hair, 
tossing them to the side or to the clever forehead or sunken bronze cheek. Sometimes the smoke of the fire flew straight at the spotted one. Then the strips of his curved eyebrows, not too bushy but fluffy at the ends, would hang lower over the hollows of his deep-set, slightly squinting blue eyes, so strangely bright in this dark face. His small, feminine, delicate mouth under his reddish mustache would shrink, his lips would protrude, the tip of his thin, curved back, moderately short nose would come close to his swarthy lips, and his strong chin would thrust far forward. Who could tell how old he was? When he smiled, he seemed young and handsome. When the smile disappeared, his face was repellent in its gloominess. Where had Varahran met this man? Not in Rega? No. Where then? The fugitive could not remember. Weep, the singer encouraged the yellow-faced captive with mockery. Moan, shed tears while it is still in your will, and I will tell you a legend about the kings of Gahamana, so that the source of your tears will not dry up. He struck a deliberately solemn pose, as if mimicking real storytellers, and took a crooked stick instead of a dutar. I begin, he shouted in a cockney voice, and struck the non-existent strings with his thin fingers. In the sky the month floats, in the river the water flows, the cauldron is made to speak, the ears are made to listen. So, listen. The cheerful beginning amused Bess, and he laughed loudly. His dry, weathered, hunchbacked face turned red from exertion. A pale Iranian in plain clothes sitting beside Bess grinned. The warriors drew closer. Even the prisoner stopped beating his head and crying. Far away in the south, by the warm sea, in the blue mountains, the Persian people lived without grief, continued the man dressed in leopard skins. They lived, lived, lived without arguing with the gods, grazed horses and sheep in the open spaces. The Gahamanids ruled it. It was children, a glorious family. And Gahamanides, named Cyrus, became the first king of the Persians. The singer silently waved his hand over the stick as if he was strumming the strings and spoke again. Far he stretched his sword. He conquered many different countries. He has never known defeat. Jan, Takatun. Do you remember Cambyses the young man? He followed, Wa. He followed in his father's footsteps. He frightened the hearts of the Egyptians. Jan, Takatam, Takatun. And his nephew, the son of Histaspes, Darius, struck his enemies hard and the country of Persians became, my children, so powerful that there was no equal in the whole world. There was no state left on earth that was not conquered by the Persians except Yunnan. There was no gold left on earth that was not captured by the Persians except the gold of Yunnan. There are no men left in the land who have not been sold into slavery by the Persians except the men of Yunnan. Well. How could you bear it? And Darius I, son of Histaspes, went to war against the Junons. Dear ladies and gentlemen, for the continuation of the story of Sogdiana, see the next episode. Leave feedback, write comments, and share this video with your friends. Voiced and translated into English, by Vyacheslav Orlov. Peace, kindness, and love to you and your family.